All right, we are in the book of Obadiah, so if you hadn't been with us in Sunday school, it's a good day to start. Let's do a little bit of review on, like, just some Old Testament type survey, just kind of lay the landscape. And if I was going to start it with the forming of the Old Covenant, I would probably start it through the man Abraham, which is the study that we've done on Genesis. So uh, from Genesis 3.15, somebody tell us what Genesis 3.15 says. What would God do to Satan? He would, and how would he do it? Uh, Through the what? Yeah, through the seed of the woman. So from Genesis 3.15, we get the reference that it would be the seed. Now, what Abraham's promised in Genesis 12 is that it was going to be his seed. So now we know exactly who this is coming through. And from that point, from Genesis 12 all the way to the end of Genesis in 50, which, by the way, we're in 49, which is super important this Wednesday night. All the way from there to there, you really see the formation go from a man, Abraham, to a nation, Israel. Everybody good? Whose name was Israel in the middle of this? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Remember Jacob's name? I think it was Genesis 28 or 32 when he wrestled with God. He changed his name to Israel. He had the 12 sons. Genesis 49. He's going to pronounce a blessing on those 12 sons. So by the time this is over, then you have Genesis chapter 50. And then what the Bible does from that point is you get what we know as the Exodus. So the next book is the Exodus. And what the Exodus is going to do, it's going to cover not only Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, D-E-U-T-E-R-O-N-O-M-Y, which means law, okay? So we call these first five books of the Bible the what? Yeah, the Pentateuch, Penta 5, okay? Or we call it the law, or some people call it the Torah, good, Jarrett. Um, This section here, from Exodus to Deuteronomy, is going to cover how long of a period? Does anybody know off the top of your head? 40 years, okay? So this is going to cover the entire Exodus, 40 years. You can, you can break Moses' life down in this way. Moses' first 40 years of his life are spent in the palace with Pharaoh, okay? Remember when, when Moses killed the Hebrew and the Egyptian, and it was known that he killed the Egyptian, where did he go? Yeah, he went to the wilderness, very good. He went to Midian, okay? So he flees to Midian to the backside of the desert. How long was he there in Midian? Does anybody know? 40 years, very good. Then the burning bush happens, and Moses comes back and leads the people out, and that's where uh, this 40 years comes in. Everybody good? We got it? So you've got that span of the, Moses lived to be 120. The last 40 years of his life we know as the Exodus. At the end of Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 31, really 26 to 32, you get Moses' deathbed proclamations as to what he says, okay? He get, hey, look, when you guys go into the land, there's going to be a time of blessing and there's going to be cursing. If you're faithful to God, you'll receive the blessings. If you break the law, you'll get cursed, okay? So there you go. Moses dies, and what's the next book? Good. Yeah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Really, if I had to make a note, if you asked me, you said, Zach, what New Testament book does the book of Joshua represent? I would tell you the book of Acts. You can follow the parallels all over the place. It would be an extended study on its own, but we won't do it. Now, Joshua is the one who goes into the land of Canaan and does the conquering and defeats the enemy. We good? Okay. And really, what I've taught you all and what we need to understand is this is all a template. The Old Testament is a template that's going to give us a physical reality. Jesus is going to fulfill this New Testament in a spiritual reality. Okay, And it's going to follow some of the same patterns. Uh, Joshua, the conquering king, uh, if you write his name in Hebrew, it looks just like this, Y-E-S-H-U-A. That is the exact same name as Jesus. When you just say it in Greek, it's Jesus. So there's your whole thought process. Joshua, Jesus, warrior king, conqueror. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. What's the next book? Yeah, good. So Judges, you get a period. Did Israel have a king during this time, yes or no? No. And it says in the book of Judges that they, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So was it a period of sin for them? Yes. So God raised up uh, even women like Deborah. He raised up 
uh, people like Samson, raised up people like Gideon to defeat the Midianites, who would come over. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, um, R- Ruth, and then 1 Samuel. Let me get to 1 Samuel in the midst of all that. 1 Samuel is where things begin to change. The first prophet that you see in the Old Testament is Samuel. Okay, Samuel is the first prophet. What is something very important that Samuel did? Good, that's exactly what I was thinking, Miss Karen. He anointed Saul because, remember, was Israel supposed to have a king like all the other nations had? No, but they wanted one. So they say, look, we want a king. And it's in 1 Samuel. Essentially, Samuel tells them, this is going to be bad news. When, if I go out and, and we get a king, then you're going to have trouble. Okay? You're going to have trouble from the get-go. He's going to take your sons and make him serve them. He's going to take your land, and it's not going to be good. They were a theocracy supposed to be a theocracy meaning theo god and law they were to be ruled by the law of god and god was to be their king but essentially they didn't want him they wanted another king what tribe miss karen was saul from good saul was from the tribe of benjamin why did benjamin immediately have the right to be the king because of what happened in the story of genesis that we know of but was saul a good king or a bad king saul was a bad king um did what happened to Saul? He wound up getting killed, more or less. He, he committed suicide falling on a guy's sword. Is that right? I think that's right. So then God says, okay, you chose the first king. I'll choose the second king. Who was the second king? David. Very good. Which tribe was David from? Good. And that's the tribe that shows the kingship in the book of Genesis. So think about it this way. They wind up. They're in the land. They're in Canaan, okay? Canaan represents the what? The promised land or the presence of God, right? That's what I've taught. If they're, as long as they're in Canaan, they're in the presence of God. So David gives them a great time of peace. Solomon gives them a great time of peace. But Solomon went into sin. He took too much gold. He took too much land. And he had too many wives and concubines, which caused him to do what? When he took... Yeah, say it, Becky. Follow false gods because he followed the false gods of his wife so God said Solomon I'm going to split the kingdom how did he split it yeah north and south how many tribes went north ten now when the ten tribes went north what do we call the ten tribes that went north Israel also can be called Ephraim okay which two tribes were in the south Judah and Benjamin what do we call the south good called Judah at that point. So it's split. Everybody good? Just recap and learn it. I think this is good. I mean, I think we need to be thinking this way so we know where we're at in the story. So God splits it under Solomon's son, whose name was Rehoboam. I won't write that down, but you can read that in the story of First Kings in that area. So Rehoboam gets it split, and then what happens? The north goes into sin, right? And who does God send to judge the northern kingdom? Assyria. Okay, what was the capital of Assyria? Nineveh. Very good. And remember the story of Jonah? Jonah's, God sent Jonah to Nineveh, the capital of the, of the people who would come and conquer them, that they would be converted so whenever they go there, whenever they get carried in exile there, they won't just murder them all because they worship the same God. 120 years later in the book of Nahum, God judges Nineveh for their wickedness because he used them for what he needed to. Is everybody good there? Following? Now, why would God bring them in the land and out of the land? They're in His presence, and then they sin, so what does God do? Kicks them out of the presence. This is over and over. It happens in the Old Testament. They're constantly in the land and out of the land. This is no different than the story of the Garden of Eden. Adam's in the presence of God, and because of sin, what happens? He gets kicked out. So you've got a picture of death, burial, when they get kicked out, and when they come back in, that's resurrection. So now, what you've had happen, when we were in the book of Habakkuk, what was Habakkuk predicting to Judah, the south? Who, what was he saying? Judgment was coming, and who was it coming from? Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar. And if you've read the book of Daniel, Habakkuk was prophesying that Daniel and all them would be taken captivity, and they would go there. Now, once that happens, they were in Babylon for how many years? You should know this. Say it again. 70 years. Remember, the 70 years Jeremiah predicted in Jeremiah 29, he wrote a letter to Daniel in exile. He said, Daniel, 
Y'all are going to be there, make babies. Some of you ain't coming back. Some of you will return eventually to the land. God brought them back to Canaan. They rebuilt the temple in the story of Ezra and uh, Nehemiah. Remember that? Rebuilt the city and the wall. So, everybody good? Bored yet? Following the story. So here's where we're at in Obadiah. You say, Zach, why'd you do all that? Eh, just for fun. Um, here's where we're at in the story of Obadiah. This is during the time of the Babylonian exile. Okay, So they are, they're cast off and they're into exile. Obadiah would have been a contemporary to um, Ezekiel, to Jeremiah, and to Daniel. So they would have been alive around the same time. We good? First thing I want to do is simply just read the book of Obadiah, all of it. It's only 21 verses. It's not bad. We call Obadiah a minor prophet. Does that mean Obadiah is less important than anybody else? Why do we call it a minor prophet? Because it's short. And this is the minorest of the minor prophets. Verse 1. The coming judgment on who? Edom. That will be extremely important. That's what this book's about. The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God, concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, let us rise up against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be greatly despised. And, and the good thing about this book, especially the first nine verses, which we'll try to cover today, is that it's simple. Uh, this is si just simple understanding. God's going to judge Edom, plain as day, because she's prideful and she comes against Judah, as we'll see in a minute. Verse 3, The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, you who say in your heart, Who will bring me down to the ground? Though you ascend as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, you think much of yourself, Edom, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. Now, how do you... How are you going to guess that God's going to bring him down? That's consistent with the pattern of the rest of Scripture. What's he going to do to Edom? Judgment by how? Say it again, Kerry. Yep, that's what he's going to do. Verse 5. If thieves had come to you, if robbers by night, oh, how you will be cut off. Would they have not stolen till they had enough? If their great gatherers had come to you, would they not have left some gleanings? And what he's getting at there, and I'll get to it in a minute, but what he's getting at is, Whenever Babylon came and judged and came and took over Judah, Edom looked at them and scoffed, and they raided them during that time. Everybody good? Simple understanding. So that's why he says, would they not have left some gleanings? Oh, how Esau, and, and here's the connection. Remember, Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and Esau's name was changed to Edom. Oh, how Esau, Edom, shall be searched out. How his hidden treasures shall be sought after. All the men in your confederacy shall force you to the border. The men at peace with you shall deceive you and shall prevail against you. Those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you. No one is aware of it. Will I not in that day, says the Lord, even destroy the wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountains of Esau? Then your mighty men, O Timon, and that's another name for Edom and Esau, that's the Hebrew word that's the same as Adam, okay? Remember we talked about that last week in Habakkuk or whenever that was. We talked about Timon, maybe two weeks ago. O Timon shall be destroyed to the end of everyone from the mountains of Esau may be cut off by the slaughter. All right, simple enough. There's some wordy language there. That's the prophets. That's the way they talk. But Obadiah is predicting prophecy to Edom. So when we go to a book and we begin to examine it, what are some of the, what are some of just the immediate questions that we need to ask right away? When, you, when you're going to begin to study a book of the Bible, what, what questions do we ask? Yeah, so we, we want to know, number one, who wrote it? We want to know the audience. We want to know the time frame. We want to know the setting. We want to know every background detail that we can know. Right? That's why I did the whole Old Testament walkthrough. And I think so many times people just open the Bible and they're like, well, it says right here, God's going to judge Edom. Uh, okay, did that happen yet or not happen yet? What's that got to do with me? I mean, so we need to understand the Bible as a story. So who wrote this book? Obadiah. Now here's the problem with Obadiah. There's like 20 Obadiahs in the Old Testament, and nobody agrees on if it's all the same Obadiah or 20 different Obadiahs. 
I tend to think that this Obadiah possibly may not be mentioned anywhere else. Um, it, that's kind of a hard thing to know. You don't know much about this Obadiah if he's not one of the other Obadiahs mentioned. Look, look with me at the top of the notes. The date of this book is unknown. It is during the Babylonian captivity because that's what he's getting on to Edom for about how they treated Judah whenever Babylon came and judged them. Bruce Gore, who is a historian, states that he prefers an earlier dating uh, and we can see from 1 Kings 18 that Obadiah was alive around the same time of Ahab. So King Ahab, who was a wicked king, remember, had an advisor whose name was Obadiah. If that's the same Obadiah, that gives you a little bit earlier dating of the book as to when he wrote. I'm not completely convinced of that. You can make your own judgment. No idea. Doesn't change anything. Obadiah means the Lord's servant or worshiper of Yahweh. We know very little about Obadiah as he's not mentioned possibly outside of this work. His work included in the Minor Prophets is the smallest book lengthwise. His, now we need the audience and who it's written to, like Miss Karen asked. His prophecy surrounds the nation Edom. This nation is famous in Israel's story as the people of Edom descend from Esau. Just as Jacob's name was changed to Israel, so too was Esau changed to Edom. And in Genesis 35, it gives this whole lineage of Edom and where they came from and who they were, just like the New Testament gives the history and the lineage of Jacob through the line of Jesus. So... I put some references in there. We won't read them all for the sake of time, but we are going to read several of them. Jacob and Esau were in constant battle during their time together with a short truce called around the time of Isaac, their dad's death. Uh, if you hadn't been through the Genesis study with us or refreshed up on it, it'll do you some good to go back and read about Esau and, and Jacob and their conflict. What was, the, what was essentially the, the point of the conflict? Who was older, Jacob or Esau? Esau. But what was the prophecy that was given? The blank will serve the blank. Yeah, yeah, the older will serve the younger. So Isaac was going to give the blessing to which son, even though he knew better. He was going to give it to Esau. So what did, what was the wife's name, Rebekah? What did Rebekah do to Jacob? Yeah, she dressed him up in Esau's clothes, and they tricked him, more or less, essentially, into giving the blessing to Jacob, though it was the godly thing to do, because that's what was predicted. Then, you remember we talked about it last week, whenever uh, Jacob was supposed to give the blessing to Joseph's sons, Jacob made sure that the blessing went to the younger son because he knew that was the pattern. And if you think about the pattern of Scripture, it was always the younger son. It wasn't Abraham's older brother, it was Abraham. Uh, it wasn't Ishmael, it was Isaac. It wasn't Esau, it was Jacob. And that pattern carries all the way through. You think about the story of the prodigal son. Was it the older son that received all the blessing or was it the younger son? It's the same. And all that points to Christ. You had the first Adam and then you had the true and better Adam, who is Jesus. Are you good? That's kind of the pattern that you get there. Nonetheless, uh, the, the big paragraph there in your notes, the fighting would continue between the two nations even after the two sons of Isaac were dead. We see the nation of Edom fully established in the lineage of Genesis 35. During the Exodus, God told Israel not to take the land from Edom because he, God, had given it to them in Deuteronomy chapter 2, 1 to 5. So God, you remember, did, Esau didn't receive the covenantal blessing, but if you'll go back and read the story of Genesis, I don't remember which chapter it's in. Remember Esau came and eventually said, is there not a blessing for me? He didn't get the covenantal blessing, but God did bless him and promised to make a nation out of him and, and to keep him around. So that happens. And so therefore, God had some, uh, he had some favor toward Edom, even though they had come against him in some degree. That doesn't mean that Edom returned the favor. Turn to Numbers chapter 20, and let's look at something right here. Numbers chapter 20. If you don't know the backstory of this, the book of Obadiah is not going to make a lot of sense. Numbers and chapter 20. <coughs> and look down with me at verse 20. So Moses and them are trying, they're on the course of the Exodus and they're trying to pass through the promised land. And they're, they're going to go through Edom, right? Well, look at what they're told in verse 20 of Numbers 20. 
Then he said, You shall not pass through. So Edom came against them with many men with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory, so Israel turned away from him. This just kind of tells you about what they thought about each other. That Edom didn't like them, they didn't care for them. But nonetheless, God commanded Israel to be good to Edom. Turn over to Deuteronomy 23 and verse 7. Deuteronomy 23 and verse 7. I've got it in your notes there. I'm just kind of following along through it. Deuteronomy 23 and verse 7. Look at what God commands the Israelites through Moses as they're getting ready to go into the promised land. You shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your what? That's the way he viewed it. You shall not abhor an Egyptian, because you were an alien in his land. He's more or less telling them, be good to those guys. They were good to you. Okay? Egypt took him in his harbor. Uh, Edom is your brother. Don't do anything to him. You come essentially from the same uh, source to a point there. All right. I'm back in the middle of the notes, um, right in the middle of that big paragraph. It says, even though they would have known this, we learn from Ezekiel 35.5 that Edom still did not like Israel. They were jealous of them. And you got to think jealousy would have been there between the nations as Esau was older than Jacob. He felt the blessing of being God's chosen people should have been theirs. But remember, God said the older would serve the younger in Genesis 25, 23. Over and over, through the history of David and the Old Testament, if you'll go back and you'll read Kings and Chronicles and those type of books, then you'll see God's people were constantly at war with the Edomites. They would fight them off, but they would still exist. And that was a pretty common pattern. Edom eventually was driven from their land um, by the Nabataeans. 553 B.C. is the date I found as to when that happened. So they were in, um, most people call it, uh, they think it was a land called Seir. Write down S-E-I-R. So when you read Seir in the Old Testament, a lot of people think that's a reference to the land. The mountains of Seir is a reference to the land of Edom, I'll be honest, I didn't study that out far enough to know that for sure. Possibly those cats are smarter than me, some of them to figure that out. Uh, some people think that. Some people think the Muslims today are descendants of, no, Ishmael. Yeah, not of, yeah, not of Edom, but Ishmael. That's a different story for another. Deal. Remember, how many sons did Ishmael have? Twelve, just like the story would carry on. So they think it was, that's, yeah, good thought, wrong guy. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the Nabadians, if that's how you say that, they come and they drive them out of their land, 553. Now think about this. Let me give you some dates here. I said that the book of Habakkuk, I thought, was written around 607 B.C., okay? So he's prophesying Babylon's judgment. Babylon's judgment comes 586 B.C. Remember, the numbers are going down. We're getting to zero. And then uh, you've got your period here. I would say sometime between, I would say Obadiah is written sometime between 586 and 553. If I was going to put my life on it now. Could it be later than that? Yeah, maybe. But it would make more sense to me if that wasn't what this was talking about. So these Nabadian people come and they drive them out. And they settle in the southern part of Israel. <coughs> now here's where this gets important. From that time, they were known as the Idumeans. Okay? So the Idumeans, at formerly the Edomites. And here's why that's important. There's a famous group of Idumeans in the New Testament. Since Edom wasn't as great as it once was, they had been absorbed into other cultures, specifically during the time of Jesus, the Romans. In 39 B.C., the Roman Senate named Herod king over Judea. Though he wasn't truly Jewish, he wound up marrying a relative who could give him some Jewish ties. The Jews would have hated it, and they knew that he had no right to claim to be the Jewish king. If he were going to be a king, especially in the south, what tribe did you have to come from? Yeah, you had to come not from Benjamin, from who? From Judah. So, I mean, this dude's not even Jewish. Furthermore, he's an Edomite. He's an Idumean. 
So when Jesus shows up on the scene, you still have the battle between Esau and Jacob going on, just carried out through different characters. And you've got essentially Esau running around saying that he's the king, that he's the one that uh, has the right to rule in Jerusalem. So what did Herod try to do to Jesus when he was a baby? Yeah, he tried to kill him. So when the wise men come, they're like, uh, where's he born king of the Jews? Because Herod, you're not a Jew. You're not from Judah. You're not the rightful king of the Jews. Everybody would have known this. When you think of Herod in the New Testament, don't just think of Herod the Great, who was the first one. you got to think about his sons, too, Antipas and those he set to rule over those regions. So just like Pharaoh in Egypt, I mean, there could have been 50 Pharaohs. And they just called him, you know, Pharaoh 1, you get your Roman numerals out. Same type of stuff would have happened with the Herods in the New Testament. So you've still got this battle between Jacob and Esau going on when you open the pages of the New Testament. But God proved and showed who would... Uh, be the rightful king. That's, and that's another reason why I think Matthew went, okay, here's the lineage. We're going to prove Jesus is the rightful king. Okay, if Some of you, you may have never heard this, so I'll just say this this way. Whenever they got sent to Babylon in captivity, whenever they came back, they never had a king just rule Israel as its own nation like they did before they went into exile. Everybody understands that. From David um, to Jeconiah, and you can read that in Matthew 1, from that period, Israel, I mean, Judah and Israel in the south, it runs its own nation, okay? When they come back from the time of Babylon, they don't have a king running like they used to have, okay? But if there would have been a king when Jesus was born, who would have been the rightful king? Joseph, his dad, the carpenter. Everybody got it? That's why you get the genealogy. That's what's so cool about the Bible. Because you think about it, it's like, oh, dude, just a lowly carpenter. No, that joker would have been the stinking king of God's people had the exile not happened. So just really cool to think about stuff that way. All right, any questions so far? I know that was a lot and a ton of history that I just threw at you. Anybody got any questions preferably that I can answer? Or are we good to just keep going? Okay? All right, I think I'm just going to keep going through uh, the rest of these notes, and we'll go from there. All right, verse 1 and 2. Let's read Obadiah 1 and 2 again. It says, uh, uh, says the Lord, concerning Edom, we have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, and let us rise up against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be greatly despised. All right, verses 1 and 2 in your notes at the very bottom. First thing we need to note is that God did nothing concerning Israel and Adam was concerning Israel because God's paying them back for what they did. Do you remember in Genesis chapter 12 when God calls Abraham? But actually, just turn to Genesis 12. I want you to see this. Because you're saying, well, why is God messing with Edom if they're kind of out of the picture? I know they did something bad to his people, but why is he messing with them? Well, look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, and let's remember what God told Abram. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land I will show you. And that would be Canaan. I will make you a great nation, which should be Israel. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Now watch verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who does what? And this is what Edom had done. So therefore Edom had come against his people. What was God going to do to him? Now let me just make a note here, because people today will still take that exact verse and say, I'm, I kid you not, I was riding in the car with one of my Pentecostal friends, he's an older guy, this week. He said, Zach, America's wicked and we're going south into moral decay. I said, yeah, I agree to that, that's true. I mean, that, I think that's obvious, maybe you disagree, I don't know. Um, he said, I think the only reason we're still here is that we, you know, that we support Israel. And I just laughed, and he said, I know you don't believe it like that. And I said, no, I don't. And the reason is because that promise is given to Old Covenant Israel that doesn't exist anymore. Who's the true Israel of God now? Anybody, whether Jew or Gentile, who's saved and believes in Jesus Christ. That's the true Israel of God who has the benefit and the blessing. Just like a Gentile who became a proselyte, essentially became a Jew whenever he was converted to Yahweh in the Old Testament. All right? So I told him, I said, yeah, I don't think that has anything to do with any of that, but... Nonetheless, I see the moral decay in America. So that's the reason for Edom's judgment that's going to get reproached back on them because they cursed God's people in that way. 
All right, I think that's all I want to say about that. Um, let's keep going through these notes. So God did nothing concerning Israel that was not revealed to his servants the prophets, Amos 3, 7. And that's what was so cool about God. It wasn't like he was just doing stuff in the Old Testament and showing up and saying, ah, surprise. Like He was calling his shots. I mean, he Babe Ruth the whole Old Testament. He's like, here's how it's going to be. Here it is, called shot after shot, and that's how it was, which is comforting to know. And you've got to think, too, God always spoke to his people. I mean, he didn't just leave them in the dark. He's always speaking to his people. And I think God's always still speaking to us through his word. You think about how marvelous the Bible is that God could write a book, though the exact, exact situations that are in every one of them, you and I aren't in exile. We're not in Obadiah's shoes prophesying to this, but could give principles for how his people should live for the rest of their life in a book. Is that not amazing to think about that way? I mean, just go to go read. If you got a question about what's right and wrong, go read Psalms and Proverbs, and I just about anything you want to ask will be answered. So I mean, that's amazing. But that's our God. He speaks to us. He didn't leave us just here wondering. So just His glory is just everywhere. Okay, verse one tells us a messenger was going out among the nations, allying forces against Edom for her demise. So the way I would understand this is. There was someone from a foreign nation who would have come and been telling all these former allies of Edom that, that they were going to team up against her and more or less judge her. And Obadiah would have got word of this. And he's telling them, essentially, here's what's coming because of your wickedness you did. Verse 2 declares that she would be small and dispersed in opposition to how great her name was. So there was a time when the Edomites were just like the... Ammonites and the Hittites and the Hivites and all the other ites. They had, yeah, they had great name, and God's predicting that's going to get devoured. And it did, because by the time Jesus comes on the scene, they're not even called the Edomites anymore. They're called the Idumeans. That's why Herod's known as an Idumean, not as an Edomite. Okay, verses 3 to 5. Any questions? We good? All right. I think we get the general gist. Somebody read verses 3 to 5 for us. <coughs> <coughs> Not everybody at once. All right, let's look back at our notes. I hear you, Miss Ann. I'm almost done. Pride is the cause of Edom's demise. Uh, she, Edom, didn't think she could be touched uh, as she dwelt on high. In the Bible, the phrasing of on high in mountains was a sign of the powerful and mighty. The Garden of Eden, many believe, uh, was on a mountain. And people think that because it said there were rivers that were flowing down out of it. And you can go back and read it. The temple in Jerusalem. Uh, it was built on a mountain. You never set a place of worship of a deity or anybody that was powerful in a valley. You always set it on a mountain. Even remember Jesus talked to the woman at the well. She said, we worship on this mountain. Even in Gerizim, they had set the place of worship on the mountain. The words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, 12 would have been helpful for Edom to hear. He said, let every man who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No matter how mighty or great, or great that we think we are, we're never too big for God to touch. Amen? And I think we've probably all been in situations in our life where we didn't think that we were touchable. Uh, we're always touchable, and we always are. And when we're in sin, we should repent and come clean on it and get in line with what God has said. Notice the emphasis that God is the one who would bring them down. How? Just like Carrie said earlier, he would send another nation to do it. This is the Sunday school lesson. Pride comes before a fall, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And I think something else you could take away from it just simply is that when we see somebody who's down in such a decree, you know, you can, you can tell a lot about a person by how well they treat somebody who can do absolutely nothing for them. I had a football coach, his name was Hugh Freeze, he said that all the time. He said, when, how well you treat the people who are of no value to you, that tells about your character. And I think that's extremely true. So when we see those people and 
you know, if we treat them poorly, if we go after them like Edom did when Judah was in her lowest spot, then I think that tells about our character. Now, Obadiah is not the only person to predict judgment on Edom. Isaiah 34, which needs to be read, Isaiah 34 and Jeremiah 49, 7-11. I won't do it today, I don't have time. But it gives us the judgment on Edom. Some commentators believe Jeremiah 49, 7-11 quotes Obadiah. Okay, so some people think that. Very possible. you got to think, Jeremiah lived from the time of Habakkuk all the way through the captivity, and even after they got taken to captivity, Jeremiah would have lived on the other side of it. So if Jeremiah was quoting from Obadiah, then Obadiah was written not too long after this was taken in demise because Jeremiah was still alive. Does that make sense? Does it help you all to see the timeline of the Old Testament when things start? Like that's one of the most helpful things to me because I read that and I'm like, man, there is a ton going on here. But if you really think about it, Listen, do what you want all the way back to Adam. People do a thousand different things. I think if you trace this story of Abraham back, I think it's probably going to start somewhere around 1200 B.C. I think you can probably put the time of Abraham right around that. So it, that helps me to think, okay, well, 1200 B.C., I got that. Isaiah prophesies 7-something B.C. That, that's before Assyria comes in and takes. Solomon was just before that. So, I mean... Like it just, when I start getting these dates, it just helps. Because you got to think, once you get from 586 B.C. to the rest of the Old Testament being written, how many years of silence were there before Jesus comes on the scene? 400. So from 400 all the way down to zero, I mean, we, you about got this thing whooped. You know what I mean? I mean, you've, you've about got a pretty good understanding of what happened from Abraham all the way until your 400 years of silence. It, just thinking about it in the smaller parts helps me because I get overwhelmed. Do you all get overwhelmed when you read it sometime? You're like, what is this? And the other problem is the Old Testament's not in order. I mean, it's, it's not written in chronological order. So even in, if you get a chronological Bible reading plan, how many of you all do a chronological Bible reading plan? Even those are going to differ. So, I mean, you can find another chronological reading plan that will be different than one you've got. So you kind of, you know, people are doing their best. They're not messing stuff up on purpose. Okay, verses 6 to 9 continue to tell us of the coming judgment as Edom's supposed allies turn their back on her. Guys, one of the most important things that I learned from the prophets, and I'll probably revisit Isaiah 34 at some point. We might even go read it next week. You're going to read that judgment language, and that judgment language is going to get picked up all throughout the rest of the book. I challenge you. You do this for your homework this week. Go read Isaiah 34.4. And then go read Revelation 6, 12 to 19. You're going to read language like the heavens were rolled up like a scroll whenever God judged Edom. He was calling them the heavens. He's going to say the same thing in Revelation 6 about the judgment of Israel or Judah. And it's just all there. So 6, like 12 to 17, that range. So importance and understanding the wording of the prophets. I mean, you can see even in how Obadiah was predicting judgment that would come. He was comparing it to this tree stuff. He's just using all these he, uh, Hebraisms. I think it's good. All right, anybody learn anything today? All right, good. That's our goal. We learn more so we can glorify the Lord. Let's pray.